Hello there, my very good friends. Andy Murray here for What Culture Wrestling, back today with a complete breakdown of WWE 24 Edge. Now, this thing has just really aired on the WWE Network. It is a roller coaster ride of epic and emotional proportions. But the thing about this documentary is that the version we got is entirely different to the one it was supposed to be when they started filming. This thing was really intended to be a look at the retired Adam Copeland, a look at how he'd adjusted to family life in the nine years that had passed since he retired from pro wrestling, since he was forced away from doing the one thing he loved the most in life. But during filming, his career prospects dramatically changed, and that altered the whole course of the documentary. This itself is just one of many revelations crammed into one of the most supercharged, sentimental, and I think best, episodes of WWE 24 that the company has ever produced. Now, these things are always pretty good, right? I mean, the floor for them is really quite high. WWE knock them out of the park time and time again. But this one, well, it's pretty special. But with all that said, let's just dispense with my bollocks and get to the content. I'm Andy for What Culture Wrestling, and here are 10 things we learned from WWE 24 Edge. Number 10, what daily life was like for Edge after retiring. In a word, hell. After retiring, it was a full year before Edge felt he was ready to get the neck surgery that would fuse his vertebrae to his neck. But before that, well, you learn that this was really essential. The guy was going through a terrible, terrible, agonizing day every single time he woke up. And his wife, Beth Phoenix, said that the poor guy couldn't even go three hours without having to lie down and rest the pressure on his injured body. The guy couldn't so much as hold a cup of coffee without experiencing great crippling pain. Now that sounds like the worst thing of all time. Maybe not of all time, but it sounds pretty terrible. And one of the first things that Edge said to Beth Phoenix when he woke up was that he didn't have a headache. Now, the thing about this headache is that he didn't even realize he had one until it wasn't there. All in all, the account of this is scary. It paints Edge as the most sympathetic guy of all time, but it's absolutely terrifying. It shows, really, that the surgery was absolutely essential. Number 9. How Edge Appreciation Night Led to Marriage The 16th of September 2011 episode of Smackdown was dubbed Edge Appreciation Night and you know the drill with these kinds of things, it's highlights, it's cheers, it's hurrahs, it's celebration, it's the clinking of glasses, hugs, handshakes, slaps on the back, congratulations, all of that. This came just five months after Edge had properly retired and you know, he probably expected to go along to that show and just have a nice time. One thing he didn't expect was that he'd kind of walk away knowing that he'd just forged a bond with the love of his life. Now Edge and Beth Phoenix had known each other prior to that, but they really bonded on the night itself and the very next day they had their first date, after which they formed a relationship. Five years later they were married in October 2016 and now today they seem like the happiest people on earth, and they've got two daughters together, which that's just lovely, isn't it? Number 8. He designed a ton of his own ring gear for WWE. About 20 minutes into the 24 special, we get a scene with Edge and Christian. They're hanging out, and Edge pulls out this shoebox. Now, Christian doesn't have the faintest idea what's in this thing, but it turns out to be a treasure trove of all things Edge and Christian in WWE. Edge's auntie had found this thing stuffed away in an old wardrobe somewhere and among it were sketches that Edge had put together, little pieces of concept art, little doodles, little comic book style drawings of how he might think his pro wrestling career would pan out when he was a kid and he was doing this years before the dream even became a reality. All in all, it's just a really fun, light-hearted, therapeutic, nostalgic scene with Edge and with Christian. And the most amazing thing of all is that years later, some of these designs would actually come to life on WWE screens. Isn't that neat? Number 7. Tommaso Ciampa's Friendly Realization so one of the most heartening and satisfying things about this whole documentary is how well WWE and Edge put the man over as just a really good human being. So we've got an example of this here. There's a story. Edge goes to the Performance Center in 2017. It really rekindles his love 
for pro wrestling, it lights a fire within him. And as part of this, he leaves the place having handed over his personal phone number to all kinds of PC trainees, saying, hey, anytime you want to call or text, man, just pick up the phone, give me a buzz. One guy who obliged was Tommaso Ciampa, who, as you know, has some pretty serious neck problems of his own, neck problems that would eventually necessitate surgery, robbing him and Johnny Gargano of the big blow-off of their long-running feud at TakeOver New York in 2019, but this was several years before that. And when Ciampa reached out to Edge, there was a conversation between them, a text conversation that lasted two hours, took up the best part of an evening. And at one point, Tommaso turned to his wife and he said, I think I just became friends with Edge. Edge came off as very selfless in all of this. All he wanted to do was earnestly help Ciampa. He wanted to guide him through a very difficult period of his career, knowing exactly what the man was going through. And he wanted to help him do this by navigating through what is and, you know, always has been a pretty ruthless WWE system. And of course, engaging with Champa only stoked Edge's fire even more. Number six, he had an epiphany after falling off his mountain bike. There's another pretty nifty story in here. It centers around Edge, Seamus, and a bunch of their mutual friends going on a mountain biking trip. And at one point, they decide, hey, let's get some content out of this. Let's film some stuff for Seamus' series, uh, Celtic Warrior Workouts on YouTube. Now, mid-mountain bike journey, at one point, Edge goes arse over tit. He falls off his bike, he's all muddy, he's a little bit bloodied up, but not too bad. And he has this realisation after popping to his feet and discovering that, aside from the superficial wounds, aside from a little bit of mud here and there, he wasn't actually feeling all that hurt. This, of course, set the wheels in motion. Edge saw this as effectively a bump, and if he could experience this situation without feeling anything in his neck, maybe he could wrestle again. A ridiculous and impossible thought it seemed, but, well, we know how things panned out, don't we? And to follow on from this, Edge actually ended up getting some calls from his doctors who wanted to check out his neck and spine for the first time since 2012. He hadn't been properly examined since undergoing surgery, and when they did examine him, they found out that the guy was in pretty good health. Number 5. Beth Phoenix didn't know about the spear at SummerSlam 2019. By the time SummerSlam 2019 rolled around, Edge was all but clear to do something physical in the squared circle. So WWE called him up, they said, hey, we've got this thing with Elias, let's do it. And Edge knew that it was in Toronto, a town he had loads and loads of history in, and on top of that, it was a great opportunity to test just how well his strengthening body was doing, just without telling the wife. Now Beth, of course, knew that Edge was on the show, but Edge told her that he was only going out there to cut a promo, he was just going to say a few words, and then he was going to head politely to the back. But, as we all know, he was telling a big fat porky pie, because out he went, speared Elias out of his boots, popped the crowd, sent them into a frenzy, and then got to the back and got absolutely bollocked. Not from Vince McMahon, of course. In fact, the WWE Champion actually gave him a cheeky wee slap on the arse as he got backstage. But Beth was understandably furious. She had no idea that her husband would ever be able to do anything like that again and had been kept in the dark. Understandable, but at the end of the day, man, surely the pop was worth it, right? Number four, Edge told AEW that he needed to talk to Vince first. Though AEW obviously aren't explicitly mentioned in this WWE production, it's quite clear who Edge is talking about when he says that another wrestling company wanted to sign him after SummerSlam 2019. And Edge, well, he sounded pretty interested. If AEW were interested in him, he was interested in them. But he did tell the promotion that the first thing he had to do before progressing with anything was talking to Vince McMahon. Now with this, Edge wasn't necessarily trying to start a bidding war, he was just trying to do right by a guy who'd been doing right by him his whole career. He thought that McMahon deserved that, he thought that Vince deserved that respect, and well, it's worked out alright, I think. Giving Vince that respect is just another shining example of Adam Copeland's character and integrity. And I think it's pretty safe to say that WWE is indeed the best place for Edge his home, it's where he has all his history, where he has all his tenure, and can you imagine, if he showed up in AEW, right, the pop would be tremendous, but it wouldn't be as special as the 2020 Royal Rumble. 
that was just perfect. Number 3. WWE gave Edge his own ring to train in. Things started getting very, very real once Edge was cleared to compete again and the race for ring shape was on. The problem was that Edge knew if he got in a ring at the WWE Performance Center, if he trained down there in Orlando, well some cheeky bugger from the internet would find out and plaster the surprise anywhere. So he came up with a solution. He didn't think WWE would actually go for this, but he picked up the phone and said, Guys, I've got my own private warehouse here. How about you uh, throw me a bone, brother, and send me a little ring so I can, you know, train and have a comeback that isn't spoiled? And to his amazement, Triple H went, yeah, sure, cool. Again, Edge said that he didn't think WWE would go for this. He thought there was no chance in hell, but hey, they did, and he couldn't quite believe it when the company not only shipped this ring, when they dropped it on his doorstep, but when they set it up for him as well. But it happened, and soon enough, Edge and Beth were running through basic drills and spots so that the man could get a feel for working again. But after a while, it was becoming pretty clear that they need to bring in someone else for the full treatment. Number 2. Edge and Dash Wilder go way back When Edge first moved to North Carolina, he met Dash Wilder. Now at the time, he didn't know the guy was actually a wrestler. Dash was working in a Gold's gym. They met that way and they shared many conversations. They became friends and again, not once did Dash say, Hey, famous former WWE legend man, I'm a wrestler too. Let me, uh, let me give you my tape. Let me slide in there. Let me buddy up. Let me milk off you. No, Dash isn't that kind of guy. And as Edge explains on the documentary, he really respected that. But eventually, and perhaps inevitably, Edge did find out that Dash was a wrestler. So, being the good guy that he is, he took DVDs anyway, he took that footage, he took it to John Laurinaitis, who was part of WWE's talent acquisition team at the time, and he helped raise Wilder's profile. Fast forward the best part of a decade, and Dash is the one helping Edge. They worked a bunch of light-hearted matches, drills, everything you could expect to get back into ring shape. Dash played an instrumental role in getting Edge ready for the Royal Rumble, because friendship Friendship's the best. And at number one, the footage of him visiting WWE HQ is fascinating. If you're a pervert for seeing what goes on behind the scenes at WWE headquarters, then you really need to see this documentary, because it treats us to an extended look at Edge not only arriving at WWE headquarters, but going through a long conversation with WWE team members over what he hoped to achieve with his return. Amongst other worthwhile incidentals, it's fascinating to listen to this man pitching that he returned in the Royal Rumble itself, as well as smaller things like specific designs, specific logos, the kind of stuff that the guy seemingly has always been into. At one point, WWE staff ask him, well, if you're coming back in the Rumble, do you want to be advertised or do you want it to be a surprise? Do you want us to maintain kayfabe? Now, probably speaking from a fan's perspective, Edge recognised that if they kept it a surprise, he could probably wreck the internet forever, provoke the biggest pop of all time, and ride off the currency of that for ages. And it's safe to say that he made the right choice. Can you imagine if they'd advertised that return ahead of schedule? It would have still gotten a pop, don't get me wrong, but we got one of the loudest pops, one of the most emotional, cathartic, deafening pops of all time this past January. So, yep, that was the right call. But anyway guys, that's it, all over, done, finished, finito, yada yada yada. Before we progress, well, before I run through all the usual stuff at the end of this video, go ahead and check this documentary out, right? If you don't have a WWE Network subscription, there's not much excuse at the moment because, well, they're doing a big old free trial, brother, so go over there, sign up, put your little code in if you need one, check it out, it's one of the best wrestling related things I think you'll see all year, and it's really worth the zero amount of currency you're gonna pay for it. It's worth a lot more than that in truth. I'm not devaluing it. Don't get me wrong, don't get me wrong. Once you've done that, let us know what you think down in the comment section below. Don't forget to like, share, subscribe, and ring the bell for notifications. After that, you can follow us on Twitter at WhatCultureWWE and myself at AndyHMurray if you wanna tell me how wrong I am. Goodbye.